All right. Hi, everyone. Welcome to another Essex political science class. Today, we're going to focus on regionalism. Remember that in previous classes, we talked about um, different levels of government. So first, um, remember that we discussed that in the context of uh, this distinction between unitary systems and federal systems. And then we saw that in you know in in both types of basic types of government there are uh, levels of governance or government. And now, um, while in uh, in the previous classes we talked about the sub national level, so uh, levels of governance. Uh, within the state or below the level of the state. Today, we're talking about uh, something that's more supranational. So meaning that's over or above the nation state. So that's why um, we turn to regionalism. As you can see here, I have a very simple definition. Uh, regionalism, it's, a, it's a, a practice, a process you know, uh, through which geographical regions become, I suppose, most signif more significant politically, okay? Or they, they become more important economic units. There are two types. You, you can have sub-national regionalism. If you're talking about a, a vast country, uh, you know, a, a country that has a continental character. So countries like Brazil, Australia, the United States. So if you talk about regionalism here, then eventually, you know, you, you will have to make connections with federalism and devolution. The other type that we're going to talk about here is transnational regionalism. So this means uh, kind of interaction, you can call it cooperation, or in some cases, a higher degree of integration between nation states, between different countries that typically belong to, to the same geographical area in the world. Okay, Not always necessarily the case, as you will see in a minute. Now, of course, if you're talking about regionalism, one of the basic questions is what is a region what do you consider to be a region there's the you know i suppose more straightforward answer a region is you know a, a, a place uh, on the globe that ha that that's distinctive you know that has certain first of all you know um it's a, a, a part of a, a particular section of the world, of a particular area in the world. Um, there are geographical links. So for instance, you share ocean, uh, an ocean or two. For instance, uh, the countries are, uh, they, they border each other, things like that. So that would constitute an area like that with uh, shared boundaries, for instance, or uh, other common geographical features that would constitute a region, right? And organizations have been established on that basis. So for instance, the European Union, obviously the African Union, you know, you're counting something like 55 countries on the continent, ASEAN, uh, the Association of South Southeast Asian Nations, as you can see here. But at the same time, there are um, associations or organizations that are, you know, a little bit more complex in the sense that they traverse, they include, um, they involve not only one continent, but they are transcontinental. NATO is a very good example, okay, because the founding members of NATO include the North Americans. Also, um, you can talk about a region in terms of, I suppose, something something that's not that's that might involve that could involve things that are less material, 
or uh, less geographical at the very least. So for instance, you know, organizations could be could be formed on the basis of shared ideology, shared values, shared cultures, you know, certain practices, certain beliefs, it could be religion as well. So you would have examples like the Arab League, you would have uh, the Nordic Council, and the EU to a great extent because of this explicit commitment to liberal democratic values. Okay. Now, there are different types of regionalism. We already suggested that uh, in discussing the previous slide. There is, for instance, security regionalism. So this is a kind of uh, regional cooperation, the primary objective of which is to ensure the protection of the member states, okay? Uh, and make sure that they would be able to stand up to, you know, an actual or perceived enemy, uh, whether that enemy could be another country that borders any of the any of the member states or an enemy that belongs to another part of the world okay so you can think of um organizations like nato and seattle uh, nato is i suppose more obvious because you know even upon its conception the one of the one of the explicit objectives was to protect countries from Soviet expansion, you know, from the influence of uh, communism, which was spreading after the Second World War. Seattle is, has the same basic objectives, but it's a little bit weirder because although it has certain similarities with NATO, it was established, you know, sometime after the war and it in a way, it would make sense for Southeast Asian nations to come together and to enter into defense agreements. But actually, the founding members of Seattle were, you know, Europeans and Americans. So, again, it's a, it's an attempt to curb or to counter the, the influence, the expanding influence of the USSR at this time. Other types of uh, regionalism, you have political regionalism. Um, this could, you know, organizations could could be established because they perceive, they see that they have shared values. They want to, you know, improve or promote the image of a particular a particular region of that particular geographical area. They want to improve their reputation and they want to be able to deal with other countries more effectively. I mean, in diplomatic terms, in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, diplomacy, in terms of uh, entering into negotiations and agreements, okay? They, they want to, you know, to be on a firmer footing. They present themselves as a kind of block, you know, that you would have to, that you would have to negotiate with. So, for instance, the Arab League, obviously, there are social cultural similarities between, you know, these countries that are part of it. And at the same time, there's a very real political, uh, political motive behind the formation of this um, organization. They wanted to make sure that the Arab countries would, you know, be independent and remain independent. Uh, keep their sovereignty and uh, autonomy um, or the Council of Europe because you know it wasn't only because of economic reconstruction but also at the same time you know establish a space where certain values uh, political values would be shared and um, you know this this area would also be governed by more or less harmonized uh, uh more or less har harmonized 
legal system. And uh, lastly, economic regionalism, another type. So it, I suppose you, you are more familiar with this, you know, um, so different nation states, different countries, they come together and uh, they enter into agreements because they want to create, you know, greater, better economic opportunities for their citizens. And they do this by um, establishing and uh, promoting, you know, fostering or really nurturing trade links between their different countries. Okay. Nowadays, this this uh, according to political si some political scientists, this is the most significant and primary form of regionalism these days. You know. Uh, geared towards economic cooperation. This can be linked to the new regionalism of the 1990s. You know, you have uh, in different parts of the globe, you have a more neoliberal way of thinking, um, the promotion of uh, free trade, private enterprise. So, so what does uh, economic regionalism entail? So you have the establishment of free trade areas. So that that would also that would also mean that uh, there's a reduction of internal tariffs, taxes. Um, you know the, the the fees that you need to to pay if you want to bring in goods into another country. So trade barriers are lowered or removed altogether. You could also establish a customs union. So, you know, as a block, as a as a regional unit, you would have common external tariffs. So those fees that you impose upon any any trade, any any business that comes from other countries. And uh, the the setting up of a, a common market or a single market. So this would uh, in many cases, this would mean there's free movement of, of workers, of labor, and also of capital. So you can, you know, people from, from the member states, they can, as you already understand, you can, you know, go to another country and uh, try to find work there. Or if you were uh, an entrepreneur or a business person, you know, you can invest in a uh, in a particular place in a foreign country, a member state, and uh, start your business there. Also, of course, uh, this means that there, at least ideally, there would be a higher level of economic harmonization, meaning certain practices are uh, become common, um, certain rules become common, that everyone is expected to follow certain rules. So for instance, uh, with regard to agriculture, with regard to the fishing industry, you know, uh, so all the member states, they would have to abide by these regulations, uh, regulations that can uh, refer to how you do certain things, so how you fish, how you, how, how you produce your crops, okay, uh, the use of fertilizers, for instance, um, you know, things like that. Um, of course, this, uh, not of course, but you know, according to commentators, economic regionalism has involved, you know, different motives like uh, protectionism. These member states, these parts of uh, these members of an economic bloc, they protect their own interests. Okay, which is, I suppose, to a great degree understandable. But at the same time, some people say, no, actually, this allows for greater engagement, greater competitiveness as, you know, these uh, these member states are able to engage, to, to deal with, you know, other countries, other, other parts of the world more effectively. Okay. In the next recording, we're going to talk about Perhaps the primary, the best example of economic regionalism, which is the European Union.